Today is Sunday, February 23rd, 2020. This is an interview of Lee Semiotin, who is a retired senior scientist from Air Force Research Laboratory. And the interviewer is Adam Pilchak. And this interview is being conducted as part of the AIME Oral History Project. We are at the Marriott Marquis Hotel in San Diego, California. And we're gonna talk a bit about Lee's past and his history and what got him interested in engineering and the sciences. Let's start with your, your childhood. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what things got you interested in engineering. Well, thank you very much, Adam, for uh, hosting this little discussion. It's always nice for uh, an old geezer such as myself to be uh, uh, to be around the, the younger folk, you know, especially the guy, the millennials and Gen Xers and so forth. Uh, I guess the best way to describe my childhood is that I was a baby boomer, and to quote uh, the great Charles Dickens. I grew up in the best of times and worst of times. I was born two days before 1950. My father was an accountant, so he wouldn't get that tax exemption, I guess. <laughs> I was six weeks premature, so uh, I guess I hit the ground running. Uh, um, I, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and the reason why I said it was good times and bad times, it was, it was sort of the height of the Cold War, the 1950s and 60s. So, that, so it, it sure flavored uh, what was happening in people's lives, uh, the, you know, with the threat of, 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 of thermonuclear war, the government's uh, dis funding decisions on research. And so the, the good part of it was that uh, the, uh, after Sputnik, you know, when I was seven years old in 1957, the government started pumping a lot of money into STEM-like education. You know, we'll, you know, we think STEM is, the STEM promotion is relatively new. It really was very uh, well-funded in the 50s and 60s. You know, Sputnik essentially was a wake-up call. Uh, Sputnik also got a lot of young people, such as myself, interested in the space program. I remember vividly following all the uh, initial uh, suborbital flights by the Mercury 7 astronauts, sitting in wonder that these mechanical machines could lift a person into low Earth orbit and then eventually to the moon. Uh, so that piked my interest, or piqued my interest in uh, space. I was very fortunate to have teachers in both elementary school and uh, junior high and high school who facilitate that interest. One thing I will say is, you know, with my father being an accountant, I grew, a, I had a great affinity for numbers and teachers who actually, you know, pushed me to, to do things that uh, you ordinarily wouldn't expect a student to do. For instance, I learned how to do arithmetic, arithmetic problems in my head, quote, you know, with great facility, you know, I, and, uh, and that was very helpful in my later life. Also had great English teachers who uh, taught me grammar and proper English, even though I don't use it all the time. You, you probably... Uh, recognize some of that from our interactions, you know, on, on uh, journal papers, perhaps. So, uh, a, you know, as I got into my teens, I was, you know, I followed the space program. I got interested in, in mechanical and engineering type problems. Uh, and I had an affinity for taking things apart. Uh, and not all, I was not always successful in putting them back together, though. So that was probably the first you know, 12, 13 years of my life. I then had the opportunity to go to a high school, a public high school in Baltimore uh, uh, called Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. And that's really where my engineering career really took off, so to speak. Uh, this was a high school that specialized in science and engineering. And we had a number, we had a lot of basic courses in electricity, chemistry, and physics, uh, as well as more application-oriented courses and, and uh, so-called shop courses. Uh, some of the shop courses included things like uh, foundry and forge. In foundry, every student had his own pile of dirt, so to speak, molding sand. And uh, we took patterns and made uh, molds, and then we had a little 
electric furnace where we melted aluminum and, and, and made small castings. So this was a high school, mind you. And Ford Shop, this, you know, Ford Shop nearly killed me. You know, each student was assigned an anvil and a furnace. We were given uh, a rod of steel, and for uh, three or four weeks in a row, we were told to, to beat the heck out of the steel to make a center punch. And then at the end of the uh, forging process, you know, we were taught how to heat treat the material. Uh, we also had pattern making shop where we learned to make wooden patterns that were eventually used in the foundry. We had a surveying course. And uh, last, uh, you know, we, we, had a, we had, I think it was two or three years of mechanical drawing, learning how to, you know, to, to make engineering drawings of uh, mechanical parts, gears, globe valves, etc. Uh, the science courses sort of complemented these more application-oriented oriented courses, and we and one thing I will say is all the teachers, you know, were really good in their specialties. You know, you know we had good math teachers. We had you know, and a lot of teachers were also were former graduates of Poly, Bomber Polytechnic, so that was very helpful. And 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 one thing that I think promotes learning is having a role model. So all the teachers, you know, had a way of living their subjects. Uh, even that even got down to English. You know, we had people, you know, who had, who had, uh, you know, written a lot in their lifetimes, and they really, you know, taught us good expository writing. So, so that background, you know, in engineering and science theory and practice, which was actually part of the motto of Poly, sort of got me on the road to becoming an engineer and understanding the importance of both the, the, the theoretical aspects as well as the practical or more industrial aspects. What an amazing uh, high school experience that sounds like. Uh, I wish I had shared the same, the same one. Uh, so I, I can, it makes sense that you're, you continued on the path to be an engineer. Um, so where did you uh, do your undergraduate studies and uh, well, why did you choose that when, when I graduated from high school, I, I applied to several universities. And uh, the one I eventually went to was Johns Hopkins. You know, I was, I was fortunate it's in Baltimore, but Johns Hopkins had a long, has had a long history of, of uh, both undergraduate and graduate uh, education. Matter of fact, Johns Hopkins was the first university in the U.S. to have a graduate school. And it was a small school where you could get a lot of attention you know, from the faculty. Uh, the subject I took up there, the major, uh, was engineering mechanics. At that time, they did not have an engineering school. It had been disbanded and then re reconfigured into more fundamental disciplines. So I was in the engineering, the mechanics department, and uh, what I learned that, you know, that some of the courses I had there were things like solid mechanics, uh, fluid mechanics, uh, ex experimentation laboratory. To, comp to complement those, I also you know, was interested in some of the more fundamental aspects of physics. So I got to take courses in the physics department, things like celestial mechanics, you know, having grown up around, uh, you know, doing the, sp the space race and having gone to a lot of uh, air shows, you know, in, in D.C., uh, I, I wanted to learn about, you know, what makes the planets go around, you know, how, what controls the orbits of satellites and, and, and so forth. So I took celestial mechanics. Also, I was very interested in ther thermodynamics. You know, I remember Einstein once saying that thermo was the most fundamental science. So I thought it was very important that I learned a lot about thermo and thermal physics. And I was very fortunate to have a very good teacher in that. I also realized that, a you know, Math was, you know, being the language of science, it was important that I get a good feeling, you know, do a lot of mathematical studying. In high school, I had taken uh, introduc introductions to both differential and integral calculus. So when I got to Johns Hopkins, you know, I, I sort of know, I went through those fundamental calculus courses very quickly, then took advanced calculus. And uh, I really liked partial differential and ordinary differential equations. So having that, that, that fundamental knowledge, which you know, Johns Hopkins really was you know, good at, not only in, in math and physics, and, but also in mechanics, I, th I thought I was, I'd gotten a very fundamental education. Uh, also, in my third year of uh, Johns Hopkins, I had the a great fortune to meet a professor who was a new assistant professor. He hired me to be his lab assistant, his essentially research assistant. Uh, 
And that was one of the best experiences I've ever had. I essentially worked to set up his laboratory. I remember setting up a linear air tract because he was interested in, in wave propagation experiments, you know, the fundamentals of, of high rate plasticity. Uh, so I set up his lab. He, uh, he had me build, you know, using a Heath kit, a power supply. Uh, so I did almost everything that, you know, I was like a jack of all trades uh, as his assistant for two years. Being, and I was his only student, so, so I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. And during that time, not only did I learn about getting your hands dirty in the lab, more so than an ordinary lab course for, for you know, an academia, but also what can go wrong. And a lot of things can go wrong you know, when you're doing research, uh, when you're designing your own experiments. Uh, so in addition to uh, doing those experiments, he also spent a lot of time with me talking about the philosophy of science and what it meant to uh, be a researcher and how important it was that our research have a purpose, that we weren't doing research strictly to satisfy our intellects, but that we were doing research you know, to helpfully eventually transition something you know, for the good of mankind, so to speak. And I remember many times we just, you know, after working together for a couple hours, we would just shoot the breeze about you know, very philosophical things. And that played a really big role in, in the forming of my approach to uh, science and engineering, in addition to what you know, the experience that I had in high school. So as you were finishing your undergraduate studies, did you ever consider just going right out into the into industry or working, or was it you were destined for graduate school and, and higher education? Well, I think, uh, you know, after I'd worked in the lab, I got the research bug. And uh, I came to realize that uh, to, to be able to continue you know, satisfying that, that, that addiction, so to speak, I needed to get an advanced degree. And, and, and fortunately, the person I was working with, Professor Bill Hartman, uh, recommended several schools to me, you know, Cornell, Brown, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and I got uh, uh, brochures from all those, from each of those universities. I looked them over and I said, well, this is very interesting. And as I was looking over the brochures, the thought came into my mind, maybe you should broaden yourself from something very fundamental like mechanics, engineering mechanics, into something that's a little broader. And uh, I quickly came to the conclusion that it would be good to understand a little bit more about materials, that all solid bodies are not continua, you know, that we, we better learn about you know, what, what makes up the material and how that affects its, uh, its properties, both during processing, manufacturing, as well as during service. So I made the decision, you know, I, I saw that Carnegie Mellon also had a very good materials department, metallurgy and materials science department, uh, to cast my lot with Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. So that was, that, that was another example that I was presented with an opportunity and I think I made the right decision. As a graduate student who did not have a metallurgy background or material science background, I, took an, I audited a number of the undergraduate courses to come up to speed. The first year graduate students at Carnegie Mellon also take core courses. And I really liked the core courses because they, they were fundamental in nature sort of like the materials uh, adjuncts to what, we, what I'd, I'd done at Johns Hopkins. You know, we, I, I can still remember the core courses of thermo taught by Professor Lupus, uh, phase transfer, transformation kinetics, uh, transport phenomena taught by Professor Sekirka, and, and structure uh, taught by Professor Bauer. So those three core courses totally changed me from being in, in a mechanical engineer to a mechanical metallurgist. I, and, uh, and so the, you know, having passed through that wicker, I then felt like I, you know, I, I made a, a good choice. I'd been challenged and, uh, and, uh, and, and survived the ritual of fire, so to speak. And that's why I became a blacksmith. Now, uh, it's, it, it's, it set the stage for my future work in the area of processing, manufacturing and processing. It's often said that uh, you're either 
like your advisor when you show up or like your advisor when you leave. And so yeah. uh, can you tell us a little bit about your advisor yeah. and the things he was I, interested yeah, in? It, you're, you're right, Adam. Uh, I've always thought that the advisor becomes like the student or the student is attracted to certain uh, types of people like themselves. In my case, uh, you know, there's only probably one or two people doing mechanical metallurgy in the department. And the one I picked out was Henry, Professor Henry Peeler. I liked him because he was very irreverent. He gave you a lot of rope to hang yourself. You know, he let you know, he said, this is an interesting problem. Why don't you go off and look into it? He wasn't a micromanager. And, and I liked his sense of humor. He, uh, he was just a good guy. He wasn't pompous. He, he, he himself had stunted under Egon Orwan for his master's degree, you know, the, the famous Orwan. And he also had studied under one of the, the godfathers of, of metallurgy in, in the processing area, Al Bakoven, who himself was, was a student of John Wolfe, you know, of the famous Wolfe series. So when I first met Henry, I said, this, this is a guy I can work with. Maybe he'll leave me alone. He did. I saw him a couple of times, you know, maybe once or twice uh, every couple of months. And he, he suggested a problem that, that had a very strong industrial flavor. One thing about Henry was that he didn't have any preconceived notions that science and engineering was the purview of people in academia. He thought an awful lot of some of the really good researchers in industry. And so that affected me that, that uh, you know, there are good people everywhere you go, not only in academia, but also industry and the government labs. And he introduced me to a lot of those industrial folks. So that really was my first good introduction to the real world and, 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 and the need to couple academic type of learning in with industrial needs. So uh, with that, with, you know, ha after two years, I picked out my thesis topic at his suggestion. It was, it was the forming of clad metals. We didn't have a contract in that area, but you know, we, all, we both thought it was a very useful topic. I was fortunate that I got a small, we got a small stipend from the Alcoa Foundation. Uh, one, you know, one of the people at Alcoa, the director of research, Peter Breidenbau had gotten, you know, was instrumental in getting us this small amount of funding. And I basically did my thesis on this shoestring, you know, very careful about spending every penny. Uh, also, you know, we, we, the, the person who invented the, clad, the method for making clad metals uh, had a company outside of Pittsburgh in Cannesburg, PA. We referred to him as Big John, John Ulam, who had the patents on, you know, for making clad coins and clad uh, cookware. John was kind enough to supply the materials for my thesis. Uh, and, I, and with those materials, I, I investigated uh, you know, the formability and workability in uh, deformation modes such as uh, sheet rolling as well as in sheet forming. At the same time, I was fortunate that uh, I was interacting with folks in the mechanical engineering department at Carnegie Mellon who were operating what was called the Processing Research Institute. Uh, it was there that I first met George Dieter who coincidentally joined moved from Drexel to Carnegie Mellon about the same time I came to Carnegie Mellon. And so I looked at George Dieter, my advisor Henry, and uh, another person, Professor John Lowe, in the area of fracture and fatigue as, as really important influences, not only, you know, technically, but also personally. Uh, they, over, they, they really were my friends, and I looked up to them as role models. Back to the thesis topic, uh, I learned an awful lot about cup, the importance of coupling our observations, our experimental work, with simple models to, to, uh, that are industrial transferable. You know, I learned that, you know, that, that not everybody can take a complex mathematical formulation or computer simulation and transition and apply it in industry. So, I think this goes back to, to, to the way Henry himself was educated by Backoven and looking at things that, that, are, that are simple but useful. 
you know, getting, getting good experimental data, making good observations, understanding them, and then interpreting them. Uh, and that's what I try to do for the work we did on clad metals. Not so much, you know, just specifically for clad metals, but to develop models that would be useful for any sheet forming or bulk work, metal working operation. So it was a good education, not only technically, but also it helped set me on the path to doing research that was basic in nature, but had a strong industrial flavor. I always say that uh, you know, the, the best engineers use science to solve their engineering problems. And indeed, you know, that, that kind of mindset came from my training uh, and experiences at Carnegie Mellon. And I'd like to thank you know, Henry and George Dieter and, and a lot of colleagues. Indeed, you know, when Newton said that we stand on the shoulders of giants, I indeed was you know, boosted up there by Henry, his advisor, and his advisor's advisor. And I was just fortunate to be uh, following that, that, that sequence of evolution. Hopefully, um, I've gone you know, a little one step beyond, but uh, I owe it an awful lot to, to these role models, these people that I really idolized and, and uh, thought were good people. And I think that's, it's very important in research to not only look at, as I said before, not only look at the technical aspects, but also how is your, how is your information, how is your knowledge going to be transitioned and used by society? Yeah, I've always really admired your ability to make uh, accessible models, uh, and I know it's widely appreciated by a lot of our, our uh, industrial colleagues as well. Uh, so now you're finishing up at Carnegie Mellon, and it's time to enter the workforce because you can't stay in school forever. Uh, and so tell me but a little I, bit about I, I was what one happened of the few, I was one of Henry's few students who finished while he was there, <laughs> so I, I'm, happy, I'm proud of that. How, uh, how many years did it take you to complete your PhD? It was around four and a half years. I had a short period of uh, one semester where I was out from some medical challenges. But, uh, and in that regard, you know, uh, you know it, it, after two years, I had to you know, have some medical problems intended to. I, I, there was a dean of the graduate stu studies who, who sent me a couple letters, and Professor Lowe sent me a couple letters to get me to come back. And, and so, and from the personal, standpoint, I was very happy to have people who actually cared about me. Nowadays, you know, life seems to be so busy, you know, and you, you, you want, you know, it, things are so hectic. But in those days, you know, I was so lucky to have Dean Strayler and a couple other folks, you know, who encouraged me to come back because, you know, it was, it was, I had some called Crohn's disease and that, that sort of required major surgery. And I was just happy to be able to come back. So uh, I was lucky. Uh, but when I was, as I was getting out, you know, uh, you know, people talk about sending out millions of resumes. I didn't do any of that. Basically, uh, a lot of folks visited Carnegie Mellon, and uh, it was actually pretty easy to get a job. You know, I, I had three or four job offers when I got out. Uh, I had an offer from a, a uh, automotive company, an offer from an R&D organization, an offer from a government lab, and a couple, one or two other offers. Uh, because I had done work in sheet forming, I decided to take uh, as my first job out uh, a position at Armco in uh, Middletown, Ohio. And that position was in the area of, of uh, developing new technology for forming of low carbon steel. So I was in the low carbon steel section. I, uh, and, and there, not only did I continue research in the area of sheet forming per se and processes, novel processes for forming of uh, low carbon steel sheets, but also I was introduced to the day-to-day -day life of, of how research fits into industrial practice. Even though I was working in the lab environment, every engineer in that lab uh, spent time on the plant floor uh, trying to understand what was happening in the hot, hot rolling operations, the cold rolling operations, uh, continuous annealing lines, and the importance of, of doing near-term research. So, so as far as I, it was a very major difference between academia in that I did not have a lot of time, people did not have a lot of time to spend a year, two or three doing basic research. It was, most of the research was very product oriented.
another reason why I went to arm care was because the, one, I was being mentored and was able to work with a fellow by the name of Roland Hook, who himself was a student of John Hearth. Roland, to me, was one of the all-time great physical metallurgists we've ever had. He did his PhD on uh, crystal plasticity, uh, slip problems in uh, a simple binary alloy. And uh, he also was one of the co-inventors of the interstitial free steel with Jim Elias. So uh, I went there to work with him, you know, from a metallurgical standpoint, get my hands around and uh, a real engineering material with low carbon steel sounds like a simple material, but it's really quite complex. And along the way, I, I met a fellow by the name of Peter Mars, who was also working in the lab at Armco. And Peter and I got to develop the working relationship to try to get some more fundamental understanding of, of what controls sheet formability. We started joint work looking at uh, texture evolution and uh, the effect of uh, processing on texture. At that time, you know, texture models were, were somewhat in their infancy. Most of them were based on work that uh, Taylor and Bishop and Hill had done starting in the mid-30s through the mid-50s. This was the late 70s, and a lot of that work had not been transitioned or widely used because it involved numerical simulations. We just did not have the computers back then uh, to do, to do the sim, you know, to discretize the problems and then to execute the simulations. Pete and I decided to attack a, a problem which actually coincidentally was, was also worked on by Henry, you know, my, my thesis advisor, Henry Peeler. Although I did not, you know, that was not part of my work when I was at Cornell Mellon. It was a problem of the deformation of, low, of BCC crystals uh, by a process known as pencil glide, where the slip direction is defined, but the slip planes are not well defined. So Pete and I both realized that the formulation of the problem uh, was not complete. I think we spent one or two months trying to complete a, a method to uh, take some of the ambiguity out of the problem, looking at both an upper bound and a lower bound method for analyzing how uh, crystals deform in a, in a polycrystalline aggregate. Now that, that, that was the essence of it. The problem was to, to execute it using computational techniques. Uh, the computer we had at Armco was a ModCom computer. So to do something that would take maybe a minute or two on a laptop computer nowadays, took approximately eight to 12 hours on the ModCom. We both you know, wrote our own versions of the computer program. He taking one approach and I'm taking a parallel, I took a parallel approach. We punched our codes in, on computer cards, you know, which you probably have never seen. And then uh, we alter on alternating evenings, we put our programs in to be executed. The output of these uh, program simulations were text, you know, predictions of texture evolution, R values, which affect deep drawability. And by this means, you know, having two independent people doing basically the same problem, we could check each other. Um, I'm strongly in favor of round robin type problems in research, especially in complex problems. And this was a good example of two people working together, not across the country, not, you know, we didn't have the internet then, and, and, and having proximity that we could talk to each other and, and have very rapid development that way. Unfortunately, this was also during the time at which the steel industry was, was going to heck in a handbasket, so to be speak. Now, we, you know, there's sharp, sharp com, uh, competition from suppliers in the uh, Far East. Armco, uh, which is now called AK Steel, which is a joint venture between uh, Kawasaki and Armco, uh, was not doing too well financially. So after six or seven months, uh, a lot of the newer people, almost all the newer people were, you know, were given their marching orders. On the other hand, I learned, you know, I was one of those guys. I learned a lot about, you know, what was industrial, industrially feasible. So that, that, that despite what happened, it was almost a blessing in disguise that, you know, uh, I learned something but another door opened from that, you know, after that experience. And fortunately, you know, I had a number, of, you know, as I mentioned before, I had a number of job offers. Uh, so I took up my second job, you know, one of the other offers from when I was a graduate student and went to Battelle. You know, I'd been bitten by the bug of industrial research, as well as, you know, wanting to do something fairly basic. 
So the next chapter of my, my career focused on and or was spent in an organization in which there was a combination of basic research and industrial research. And Battelle was indeed that organization which enabled you to do some of both. So why don't you tell me about some of those clients? Well, as I said, we had uh, a, a plethora of different sponsors or clients. Uh, just a little background first was that, that Battelle was set up in 1928, I think. And coincidentally, there's a lot of coincidences. Like this, this is really interesting. Battelle was, a, uh, uh, was founded or, or underwritten by a fellow by the name of Gordon Battelle. And Gordon Battelle, I, I don't think had ever gotten married. He, he made a lot of money uh, through uh, his work in uh, the Masabi Iron Range. So indirectly, that iron range also supplied a lot of the iron for, for, for the steel industry. So Gordon Battelle believed very strongly in industrial research and industrial environment. So when he left the, a, a chunk of money in his will to set up a research organization, the prime thrust of, of that organization, which became Battelle Memorial Institute, that's the form, formal corporate name, was to do industrial research for the, the betterment of mankind. Uh, and for many years, you know, the, the, the main strength of Battelle was its materials research, sort of along the lines that you know, Gordon Battelle's background in, in the materials industry. So the main areas of research you know, were not only industrially oriented, but they were academic, you know, I'm sorry, government related. So many year, for many years, uh, people, you know, the average staff member worked on problems that both were funded by industrial organizations as well as projects that were funded by government. Uh, before I came, unfortunately, you know, Vitell had made it too much money uh, a lot of it was, was you know, the money that Battelle had made you know, through its contract research was uh, made off of uh, its development of the Xerox patent, Xerography patent. Uh, you know, so so they, they were instrumental in setting up what was called the Haloid Corporation, which uh, marketed, manufactured and marketed Xerox equipment. And for four or five years before I came to Battelle, a uh, probate judge in Columbus, you know, Read the Red Gordon Battelle's will, saying, "No, we're not supposed to be making money. We're supposed to be doing good for good for mankind." And he found that he looked at the stock portfolio for Battelle and said, "You guys are making money left and right. You better start diver divesting of some of this wealth that you had accumulated." And at that point in '73, you know, we the, the corporation started you know building things in Columbus like Battelle Park, Battelle Planetarium, Battelle this, Battelle that. And uh, so, be beginning five years before I came, it became more and more important that we go out and find clients. There was less money from the corporate coffers to do, uh, you know, wild eye, you know, research. That you know, so we really were pushed to to get cl you know, new clients. Although, Battelle had always done you know sponsored research, you know, if, 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 you know, in the early seventies, it, it became even more important that that the staff members developed new projects, sold them to either industry or government, ex and executed them, and made sure they did a good job so that they would get another project. As I said, we had both industrial clients and, and government clients. The industrial projects were typically smaller in dollar value, shorter in duration, and much more focused. So, uh, you know, among the early projects that I worked on for industry, you know, a lot of them were process development oriented. I was, I was in the, this, the group that was referred to as the metalworking group, which worked hand in hand with the physical metallurgy group. But being in processing, you know, I, you know my, my, my bent was more towards, you know, heat them and beat them, you know, make something, you know, make something in, in, in industry. A couple of the, you know, so my, I remember my very first project in, you know, for a company was for Champion Spark Plug Company. You know, they, 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 they wanted to develop a method to make a clad, uh, a nickel clad copper spark plug, 
which was used, uh, which would give you much better performance. You know, the, the, the copper to, to dissipate heat during the firing of the spark plug and the nickel to provide corrosion resistance. You know, so so uh, that that was probably my first big industrial project. That probably lasted six months. In the laboratory, we made small scale tooling uh, to do a small scale uh, extrusion, backward extrusion or piercing operation uh, to make a little nickel cup. We put a copper slug in it, and then we co extruded it to make this electrode for spark plugs. Uh, we developed the process variables. We were we were uh, working with a equipment manufacturer, you know, that made headers. It's a type of machine that actually can do these these operations at high speed. Uh, we we worked out, you know, the characteristics of lubricants, uh, forming speeds, and so forth. This was going to be a room temperature operation. Uh, and then eventually, after, after we developed the process parameters, we had to demonstrate for the industrial client that it worked, that we can make you know, more than just you know, 10 or 20. So in, we, we set up the tooling in an MTS servo hydraulic testing machine, and I think we made something like 100 of these electrodes within a, you know, a day. We just demonstrated that you go bang, 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 bang. A year later, uh, my supervisor and I went up to Champion in Toledo, and they were making, I think, uh, millions per year. They were at that production rate, and they'd, you know, lines upon line of heading machines. They're going bang, 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 making our electrodes, which was, you know, went into the so-called copper plus spark plug, you know, a product that's widely, uh, was widely marketed. I'm not sure if they still make it. Another project I remember involved looking at uh, the manufacturing of appliance and uh, brake line tubing for Bundy tubing. And uh, that project uh, was also a very short duration. I think that was six months also. Uh, we actually paid a visit to Bundy tubing you know, and saw some of the problems. Uh, the uh, brake line tubing was double, double wall copper braze tubing. And we had to uh, figure out a way of, you know, of you doing something that was higher speed, you know, using electric resistance heating. Uh, for, the, for the appliance tubing, uh, that, that involved you know, uh, seam welding of low roll forming and seam welding of low carbon steel. The problem with, with that operation was that this tubing, when it would come off the line, would be brittle due to quench, crack, quench cracking, rapid cooling of, of low carbon steel leads to difficulty with subconforming. For instance, if you have a, co a cooling line for a, a cooling system in a refrigerator, you've seen the coils of, of, copper, of tubing. Uh, when, we, when they would take, the, when a, man a secondary manufacturer would take that tubing and try to bend it into shape, it would, it would often uh, kink or break. So we had to you know, design a heat treatment line or modify it, the heat treatment line of Bundy tubing to, to prevent that quench crack a phenomena, quench aging, cracking phenomena. So uh, the way we did that was we, we, we had a Glebal machine, a direct resistance heating machine at Patel. We went for various thermal cycles uh, at the same time understanding the kinetics of, of, age, of carbon aging uh, to tell them you know, how to actually design the temperature versus time profile or the temperature versus distance, since this was a continuous line at Bundy tubing. And that research led to them you know, changing their, their heat treatment line and uh, getting away from the quench aging problem. So that, that, that was very exciting. Uh, we also did a lot of work for the forging industry. A lot of the projects at Battelle, uh, or a number of the projects at Battelle were, were, were funded by uh, multiple clients. And one of, one of the biggest ones we had, which uh, Professor, Al not Professor, Dr. Alton had, who was at the time was the research leader for the metalworking, one of the metalworking groups, uh, involved uh, getting, I think we had 40 forging companies sponsoring generic research that all of them could make use of. So I was uh, in charge of uh, some of the tasks related to things like characterization of uh, 
of uh, material flow properties. So I got to learn about a whole, many different material systems. You know, we'd ran tests to determine the flow behavior, you know, plastic flow behavior widely different alloys, aluminum, nickel, tie, uranium. You know, do you think we, we, we've, we've tested it? Uh, and then we also, you know, also was heavily involved in looking at dye materials and dye wear. In that regard, you know, we didn't, you know, I got a chance to spend a lot of time on the shop floor uh, looking at different dye materials and dye treatments at, uh, at the, let's say, at the Ford forging plant. They were, they were kind enough to let us into the forging plant to t test out some of the dye, dye coatings and, and dye treatments, like nit ion nitriding versus salt bath nitriding. Uh, and, we, uh, you know, we actually ran it under production conditions, took sample, took forgings off, which would indirect, indirectly serve as indicators of when you had problems in the forging operation, like thermal cracking, abrasive wear where the dye would wash. Uh, take these symbols back and analyze them to see how well our, our dye treatments were doing. So these industrial products to, to, to modify a processing line, to develop a totally new process, uh, to look at you know some of the key cost elements of forging, you know all all were very useful to 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 to, to get a handle on what's happening in the real world, and to understand with some of the limitations are with regard to industrial research. We don't have infinite time. You don't have infinite budget. You have to be focused, develop a solution you know, for, for the client. You know, I've, I, I can remember projects that lasted one or two days. They would give you $1,000 to say, okay, I want to roll some material in, in, in the lab, and, uh, and, and, and then you, you send a sample that can all characterize it. A number of those projects were done for companies who were working on the National Aerospace Space Plane Program, for instance. We, we were, you know, that's where we started working on rolling of, of gamma titanium aluminides, uh, an inner metallic alloy system, which, uh, you know, is very difficult to form. We developed a, a process to better roll it using unheated rolls. You know, prior to my coming to Patel, we, we, we had something called heated roll rolling. It's sort of the rolling equivalent of ice thermal hot dye forging, but on a, on a rolling mill. And we had demonstrated that you could roll gamma tie aluminides uh, via this heated roll rolling system. Uh, at that same time, when we were doing heated roll rolling, you know, we were interacting with the universities as well. Jim Williams, you know, your thesis advisor, uh, was, was involved in that project. And uh, but you know we soon realized that if we're ever going to scale this problem process up, we're not going to be able to do it using heated roll rolling. Uh, it was just it just wasn't feasible. So we looked into using simple models of the temperature transients during pack rolling, where you put the workpiece inside of a productive can or or pack. Uh, you you uh, uh, evacuate it and seal it. Uh, so there's no oxygen contamination. And doing the analysis of, of how much heat is lost, we could determine you know, what temperatures are, are experienced by the workpiece inside. For gamma titanium aluminized, the working temperature range is very limited. So we have to you know, design the pack, covers, interlayers, parting agents to be able to roll this, you know, to keep it within a very narrow range of working temperature. And I think uh, uh, you know, we were successful and I think that, you know, in the late 1980s, we, at that time, we rolled the biggest known sheets of gamma aluminide on our, our lab mills. I think we rolled a sheet as big as 16 inches by around 36 inches. We could have gone further, but that, that was the limitation of our reheat furnace. At the same time, you know, it, I want to emphasize that it wasn't, it wasn't enough for us just to learn how to do this ourselves. We had to show others. So. I remember uh, going on a number of trips to other com to companies who actually had large-scale rolling equipment, uh, and showing them, you know, how to make the packs, how to roll it, and they actually demonstrated some of these techniques on their own equipment. And that was that was very very important that we transition that. Another set of industrial-oriented problems or projects was sponsored by Electric Power Research Institute, who uh, funded Battelle to set up something called the Center for Materials Fabrication. Uh, the main objectives of the center were A, to do research on technologies that benefited electric utility customers 
in the you know uh, secondly to to you know to train these ut utilities and their industrial customers on emerging technologies and thirdly you know to be available to answer questions of, of an industry my role in the center was uh, I was made the director of R&D uh, and I, I was in charge of formulating and executing some of the R&D projects one one of the major areas that we got into was the induction use of of induction heating in processing operations. And one of the very first things that I looked at was the possibility of doing short time heat treatments, such as uh, looking at short time tempering uh, of metals. Uh, that was driven by an industrial customer, Ajax Magnathermic, and other induction heating companies that made inline rapid hardening tech, uh, hardening processes and associate induction equipment. But when they would sell that equipment to customers, they often would harden with induction, but temper with furnaces. So we, we set out to, to look at the the the, the feasibility and the benefits of short time tempering using induction methods. We were successful and eventually uh, some of the primers we developed, and I think this was the mid 80s, were, were transferred over to uh, uh, industrial use, where they now are doing continuous uh, hardening and tempering. We also looked at uh, phenomena for heat treating sheet metal in a continuous fashion, be it annealing or some other process. And it was during that time, mid, late 80s, that we worked with Ajax Magnathermic under the auspices of EPRI funding for our center to uh, develop transverse flux induction heating. Uh, this was a process that originally got started, I think, was in the United Kingdom, mostly for annealing of aluminum. <clears throat> One of the drawbacks was that uh, the inductor that they that they were using overseas was could only treat a thing a fixed width of, of sheet metal. We worked with Ajax to develop a variable width inductor, so you, you could vary the width of the feedstock, and that was a very important for you to be able to, you know, handle coils of different widths. Uh, this process was also demonstrated at, uh, Al at Allegheny Ludlam up in Lockport, New York. Uh, so that, 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 that was nice to have that, that kind of process transitioned. With regard to the uh, tech transition activities, uh, in addition to my role in the research arena, I was also asked numerous times to provide courses and to give talks at either utility companies or their industrial customers regarding some of the technologies like induction heating, IR heating, and so forth. It was during this time that I got a nickname uh, from one of my colleagues, Tom Beyer. He, he started calling me Doctor of Process Heating you know, because of the use of special heating technology for uh, you know, manufacturing. but. Uh, you know, he said, no, Dr. Process Heating is too long. Let's just call you Dr. Heat for short. Uh, there were some you know, people in the communications area of this center who said, well, this is really great. We got a guy named Dr. Heat. He travels around the country giving talks, educating our, our industrial users, not just in, in, in electric-based heatings, but also you know, the economics of electric versus you no know, fossil fuel heating, because I was you know it was our mission not so much to promote electric heating but to promote energy efficiency, uh, and thereby keep the industrial customers you know healthy uh, and our suppliers healthy. But anyway, so so they started calling me Doctor Heat, and uh, the communications people said, let, you know, let's let, let's try to make this into something that you know some develop this into something that people will read in a newsletter. So they made me into a cartoon character, and they'd have cartoons to to promote electric-based technologies, and they showed Dr. E in different situations, you know, trying to recommend something. So uh, that, that was, you know, sort of, I felt honored, and uh, I have a good sense of humor, and I'm very irreverent, so that, that sort of fit my personality. Working in research, as you probably know, Adam, is, can be a very humbling experience, and I think uh, the more you learn, and you probably heard this, you probably feel the same way. The more you learn, the more you you, know, you realize there is to learn, and that's why research is, su is such an energizing endeavor. It's because you know 
you know, it, it's, 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 it's wonderful to, to be able to learn something new every day and, and to be able to eventually use it is, is, is it really drives you. So I, I gave some examples of, of our industrial work, uh, both for individual sponsors, for group, you know, generic research for group, a group of clients such as the, the forging industry, as well as our work on this center, the Center for Materials Fabrication. And all, all during that time, you know, we were doing snippets of basic research. At the same time, we were doing you know, things that were very industrially oriented. So it was, it was a nice combination. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, they're working on the industrial projects. We, you know, we, we also had a lot of government funding. The government projects, you know, typically were longer in duration. They involved uh, usually larger budgets, and the technical breadth was was wider. Um, and in the in the nineteen eighties. Uh, early, late 70s, 1980s, when I was working at Patel, we were very fortunate to, 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 to be coming along when, when computers started getting faster. You know, Moore's Law started, you know, started helping us out quite a bit. You know, the old ModCom computer from, from Armco days could do one problem you know, overnight. You know, when we went to Patel, we started buying, uh, we started buying uh, PDP computers. Where, where we, we now have the opportunity to start thinking about, can we actually do more complex forming problems? Uh, we were very fortunate that the Air Force recognized the need for computational simulations in processing industry. Uh, and th this was recognized by uh, both the basic arm of the Air Force, AFOSR, and uh, the more applied people at the Air Force Materials Lab. This was in the 1980s, minor, late 70s and early 1980s. Patel bid on something that, that was referred to as the Processing Science Project. And that was probably the first among, if, if, if not the first, among the first to try to integrate modeling and simulation techniques that are computer-based for both processing, behavior, life prediction, and economic considerations. So the genesis started with the Air Force. There have been some uh, previous efforts, you know, in small parts of the what we now refer to as ICME, Integrated Computation Materials Engineering. There was Project Themis at, very, at, at I think, University of Kentucky, but this was the first, what I think was the first real attempt to integrate mechanical, mechanics people, materials people, uh, indust industrial research organization, and academia. So when, we, when this project started, I think it was started eight months after I got to Battelle, this government, large Air Force government sponsored project, which went on for four or five years. We put together a team, you know, with the Air Force being the program management. They also did technical work, of course, in, uh, at the, what was, was now called the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, we, we put together a team involving uh, a number, besides the researchers at, at Patel itself, we had a number of university partners as well as industrial partners. The uh, universities included Howard Kuhn at University of Pittsburgh, uh, John Jonas at McGill University, Rishi Raj at Cornell, uh, John Hockett at, at Los Alamos National Lab who had a CAM plastometer. You know, a very unusual piece of equipment for, for measuring flow, flow, the flow behavior of metals, a uh, couple others. Uh, and then industrially, you know, we, we worked with Wyman Gordon up in Worcester, Massachusetts to do demonstrations. And what was nice about the project was that in addition to doing the basic research, understanding material behavior during processing, be it in microstructure control or defects, uh, but, you know, we also were looking at, you know, uh, we, we chose a demo problem, which in this case was development of a process and the fundamental understanding to make a dual, a graded microstructure, so-called dual microstructure, dual property compressor disk of the titanium alloy TIE 6242. Uh, so that was, the, you know, that, that was the foundation for all of our research, and, and it led me to believe my you know, future endeavors that it's always good to have a good a demo that you can base your research on. 
So this whole team was working towards a goal, doing fundamental research you know, under this Air Force sponsor program, at the same time knows, knowing that we'd have to demonstrate the utility of these, this basic knowledge for making a part that eventually could be used in service. Uh, so this, you know, so there were the people. You know, the, I mentioned there were the materials peoples uh, working on fundamental material behavior models. There were guys looking at you know, service you know, with limited fatigue and fracture. But at the same time, there was a group at you know, some of us at Patel uh, working on development of advanced mathematical modeling techniques for simulating metal forming problems. When the, when the, the processing science program first got started, we, you know, we were thinking, let, let's use the upper bound method for analyzing metal flow. Soon into the project, we realized upper bound method wasn't going to work. And at that point, we uh, decided to, to, to shift gears. I think we were maybe six months into the project. We said, okay, we're going to put our money not on the upper bound method for simulating this, you know, the forging process. We're going to try to, with the new, the, the new faster computers, we were going to develop a, a, a finite Elman method program, FEM program. And that, and that was probably the best decision we made with regard to the computation aspects of the project. Fortunately, at the same time, we, we, we got a new staff member uh, who came, I think, probably a year after. I, I came in January of 78, Sui Go had just finished his PhD at University of California, Berkeley, which was also one of the uh, team members on the program. He came to Patel and started work immediately on developing a program, uh, a computer program, an FEM program to analyze forging problems. And that program was called Analysis of Large Plastic Incremental Deformation, ALPID. Uh, I remember, you know, after, after a year, we, we actually had a, a, an FEM engine uh, that was work, workable for which we could do both isothermal compression testing simulations as well as non-isothermal compression uh, simulations. We were at a, the annual review meeting, I think it was 1980 or 81, it must have been 81, where we demonstrated the, the, the capabilities of the, of the ALPID code and everybody's mouth jaw just dropped. It was, it was in the, with regard to the detail that could be seen with this, this computer code. It was quite amazing. So that was the genesis of, of, of at least in this country, you know, the joint work between Battelle, Suik, and Shiro Kobayashi at UC Berkeley. And Tylen Alton, who was the, the government, or the Battelle PI, who also was a Kobayashi student, you know, in developing, you know, FEM codes for, for metal forming, which were eventually became general purpose. My main role was, was more the metallurgical aspects, you know, making sure we, we develop useful models for, for uh, flow, flow, plastic flow behavior, defect evolution. I worked very closely with John Jonas at McGill. We had a, both had a great interest in uh, flow, plastic flow and flow localization problems that limited workability. You know, at the same time, I had another Myself had another uh, grant from Air Force Office of Science and Research to understand shear band formation. He looked at problems involving tensile instability, the kind of thing you're interested in, in sheet forming, drawing of polymers, and so forth. So we naturally had a very good relationship, you know, working on those kinds of problems. Rishi Raj worked on fracture, you know, uh, wedge cracking during hot working. It was it was just a great team. It was a very active time, and. Uh, I think we all worked together. It was well managed, it was well funded, and we had a lot of support from our, gro our government program managers who themselves were doing work as well. So it was an exciting time. It really was being there, so to speak, on the ground floor. Mm -hmm.